Jake is obviously a fictional guy. I mean, I look like him. So. <laughs> There's, there's that similarity, but that's pretty much it. I mean, he's a fictional character that's a creation of a lot of different people. I don't have, yeah, I don't have the qualities of kick down the door or punch the guy and ask the questions later. I usually a pretty sensitive fellow. I like to uh, find out what the problem is before we get to the fisticuffs. Or <laughs> okay, we have several people with their hands up. So, uh, here with the next. Bob. I'm not an acting or theater student, so my interest is a little different here. Um, recently, I was having a discussion with someone about the CBC and the merits of having a Canadian public television network. And so you said that you really wanted to maintain your, or not your, but our Canadian identity and try to emphasize that with this. Do you feel that going to a private network would have, would have inhibited that and that they would have tried to control your talent instead of allowing you to no, I, well, it's, a, it's an awesome question because it's like extremely relevant, I think, in who we are as people. But all those networks, all the private networks are still extremely publicly funded. Right. Uh, you know, they, that's another conversation for another time, but they all, we have a, a population of 30 million people, okay? We're, we have a landmass that's twice the size of the United States of America, or almost. Mm -hmm. We have, they have 300 million people, and we're right on their doorstep. Their culture is, it, we're constantly being inundated with their culture, good or bad. You know, I don't have a judgment towards that. It is what it is. They make great television, and they've been doing it for a very long time. Our industry, in terms of theater in this country, is really young. It's the 70s. It's really when the, the, the birth of Canadian theater really started to happen. Film and television around the same time. The question for me is like, as Canadians, it's fine if, if we don't want to, any first world country that has a population around our size is a subsidized in industry. It just, it won't work any other way. We don't have enough of a domestic, uh, con domestic consumers for us to fully fund our own product. And because we're so close to the United States, we'll truly just have their product on our televisions. And that's, if that's what we want, that's cool. But I feel like we have a responsibility, those of us in the industry, to sort of fight for our own identity and to celebrate it and to uh, challenge it and to um, express who we are. And I guess the question is, is how do we want to be represented? Do we want to be represented as the, you know, dumb guy in the sitcom that America makes that says A after every word, which is, you know, possibly how we'd be re represented? Or do we want to put that image of ourselves out there. And I personally would rather define what we are than have others do it. And that's a, a big part of a uh, passion that I have about the industry. So then would you mind if in my next discussion I paraphrase you as saying that the CBC helps to keep individuals who want to maintain that identity and, and gives, gives them a, a way to do so? I would say that, you know, Frankly, that having a public broadcaster like the CBC, there's a lot more to it than that, too. But I feel like anything that not just the CBC or any network that promotes Canadian uh, uh, content contributes to our culture, cultural identity. And I think that's super important for us as a nation. But, anyways. Uh, yes. How do you come up with the material for every season or the scripts for individual episodes? Uh, we have like, a pretty cool brain trust of writers that uh, we, we're constantly working, uh, starting, uh, we're starting breaking, we break stories, personal arcs for each character, we break each A plot uh, individually, we sort of work on all of it together and we uh, vet through different story ideas, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. It's a long, cool process that, uh, you know, you get an outline and then I note the outline, send it to the network. The network notes it, the writer will rewrite it or I'll rewrite it, then we'll write a draft, and the same process goes through with every draft of every script. There's a question here. Yeah, just besides lo location, what, what do you think is intrinsically Canadian about the show? Like we have sort of an improv Canadian modesty grew up dynamic and some things. Do you, do you think that there's more to be defined about Canadian identity in, in on television particularly? Do you think or do you think a lot is to be mapped out? I don't, I mean, I try not to uh, hit anyone over the head with anything, right? I just try to tell stories that work within the structure of an hour-long drama, comedy, 
adventure show. You know, I'm not trying to carry a political banner in any way. But at the same time, you know, those people are, we're Canadians writing Canadian content. It has a formula that works in not only Canada, but America, or Great Britain, or anywhere that they make television. That formula is not specific to any region, you know, a mystery kind of comedy adventure show. Although when I say it like that, it does sound kind of unique. <laughs> mystery, comedy, adventure, action. It's a drama. Scooby-Doo. It's a drama. Scooby-Doo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but without the GTA. But so, no, I, I, we, I don't try to, you know, drive that down anyone's throat. I just try to uh, allow it to be there. And the Newfoundlandisms are Canadianisms as far as I'm concerned because we're a part of the country. I just kind of keep it as authentic to the place as possible. Aside from the, you know, car chases and the explosions that don't happen every day. No, they do. Do you think it's easier portraying your character on film than it is in theater? Uh, no. I mean, I think that the process is... Uh, you should talk. You haven't talked in a while. <laughs> what? Is that enough for a second? Sorry. Do you think it's easier portraying your character on film than it is in theater? Picturing the characters on the show? Portraying, do you think it's easier there? Uh, it depends. I wouldn't say easier. It's just, it's just, um, it's just different. Um, I, actually, it's funny because uh, just a, a few moments ago, Alan and I were talking about, hey, listen to me. I just felt like a teacher for a minute. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. No, no, no. I just, no one else could see what I saw. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. Uh, we're, we're actually. What? No, 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 no. Um, it's, uh, I think, uh, it's different. Ellen and I were actually just talking about in theater, like, I still get really nervous before theater. So, in a way, I don't think it's easier. I think film and, film and theater are quite different things, but as long as you're really super committed and you know the character and you serve the scene and not just yourself, uh, I don't think there's much of a difference. But for me personally, I find theater, I get really nervous still. I get nervous before auditions. But on set, I don't so much because everyone is so, um, like everyone knows each other so well, and you can always do another take. Yeah. <laughs> Film and TV, like theater, is still uh, my my favorite thing to do because it's there, it's it's live. You can't uh, if you're faking, you're faking. You can just feel it from the audience. You, you, it's a it's a really great learning tool for me as an actor. But there's a great thing. I always film television. You know, a short short while ago as an actor. There's an intimacy you can achieve that's very special. There's, you have to do a lot less to reach uh, to reach people. And you know, your audience is all about how big your audience is, and the film television is much smaller. I, I love it. Um, how like how was the origins of this show? Like, how did you get on CDs? Uh, I had the idea like when I was you know around your age, and I was sort of uh, working through a number of different show ideas with my writing partner, Perry Chafe. And I went to theater school and it didn't leave me and I kept working on other ideas and I've been working in the theater. I started a theater company in Toronto. Uh, I kept working. Uh, little by little I started doing more film and TV work as an actor and it just led me to the doorsteps of all the networks, not just CBC but a couple of the other ones and we are all talking about different projects. And I was pitching show ideas, like nine of them, that weren't this show. And they weren't quite working. And I was walking out the door, and I stopped, and I turned back, and I was like, there's this one other show idea I had, which was this one. And a year and a half later, we were making the pilot. Just, you know, it goes to show that uh, no idea is a stupid idea. Unless it's really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you've written for film at all, but uh, just like the sheer volume of writing required for TV to have like hours and hours of content, do you find? Like, I feel like that would be really difficult to um, extend with a story for that long, but obviously do it quite well. I'm curious uh, methods, if that help with that, or how you have filled that space? Uh, thanks. That, uh, it's great. We've written 38 hours of television currently shop, which is uh, a lot of hours of plots and, and you know, and 
we had a five-year plan for what the show was going to be in the very beginning. Of course, we've you know raped and pillaged that plan over and over again, and stuck it in season one, and stuck ideas from season four, and put it in season two, exactly, et cetera. But you just got to, uh, you know, the show evolves every year, too. We're starting to discover more and more what the tone and structure of the show is, and it's become clearer and clearer, and that makes the breaking of the plots easier and easier, too. So they just kind of come. you got to have really talented writers who work with you, you know. You can never do it yourself. Do you find you have to delay plots in any way, like, to keep things that you want to... Does that make sense? Like, you can't get right to the heart of the problem yet because you have so much more season to fill, or is that not... Um, well, you just, you, you kind of, you map it out, right? Are you bored out of your mind? No, I'm, I'm, I'm planning what I'm going to do tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hanging out with those two to make it up. <laughs> Sorry, I'll owe you a coffee or something. Oh, no. you, pl- you plot out what the series arc is. You plot out what the series arc is like from the beginning to end. The beginning of every season. So you have different trajectories that each character takes, and you just kind of have that all planned. So it's not that you would delay, you just... You know you have to fill the 13 episodes, and it kind of it's like a 13-hour movie in a lot of ways. So you've already talked about uh, how you get into your own character and whatnot. Um, for people like us who, if we are, if we are going to get a chance at, uh, at television or film, we're probably going to start with you know one-off characters, one-liners, things like that. <coughs> what can we expect to get from the? production side by way of preparation for us? Like is it, do we get anything more than a script, or is, it, is that all it is, and we have to try and get the character from that? Sometimes you don't even have a script. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you'll get a page. And your job ultimately becomes uh, that, you know, all that stuff is kind of relevant. Your job, you know, you should probably talk to that, because... Well, um, with the... Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of times, uh... Yeah, you, you, for an audition, for example, you'll get like, yeah, you might get a page, you might get two lines, something like that. But you have to, I would work around with someone else. Every time I get an audition, or every day before, I, I try and go over my lines with someone, because I know, it's, I know it sounds obvious, but you've got to know your lines. That's always number one in my, it, it's, it's the most important thing. Because they shouldn't be lines, and if you don't remember, I, it, it just takes everything out. And I always go over it with someone else, but... You gotta make a decision. Like I always try and do something too that's um, that's not necessarily expected, because when you do it the expected way, they're gonna see a hundred of those. You know what I mean? So try and find a reason, but it has to be like it has to be believable. Everything has to be believable. So you need to find. You don't just do something weird just to do it. You find another way in there that makes it interesting. Because what I love about great actors or great film. Or stuff is something that's interesting, something I didn't see coming, and that's why I love being on the show. It's great. It's it, like I read a script, and I'm totally, totally surprised all the time. So I say try and find something that's interesting about it, that's not necessarily the obvious way, and work on it to death, and just find a way that works for you. But you got to trust yourself. If if someone tells you something that you think, for whatever reason, you can't even articulate it, it doesn't work, then don't do that. But I would say just you got to you got to work hard. You have to prepare a lot. You know, it's a, it's a process, you know, it's like, uh, what I used to do, because I was terrible at auditioning, man, I was, I still am, I bet you I still am, I, haven't, I just haven't done it in a while. It's a horrible process, it's, but it's, it's such a, it's a reality that you have to embrace and make it your own if you're going to do that. And uh, what I did with a bunch of my buddies in Toronto was, uh, we like would go into the local casting house, rent it at night on Monday nights. And we'd audition for each other, three of us. Then we'd watch them, two takes each, watch them afterwards, do an analysis of what I was doing that was shitty, which is which usually was a lot of things, you know? And then you sort of try to remedy that, stay truthful. And the basic thing is like, know what you want, go after how you're gonna get it, and that's sort of the basic things, you know? All of a sudden, know what your actions are. Whatever. Did you ever have moments in your career when things were looking really bleak and you felt like quitting and what kept you going when you hit a dead end? Every day of my career. <laughs> Basically. I, I, I've always said to anybody that's sort of in the business, starting out in the business, if you can imagine yourself doing anything else, like if you can actually imagine yourself doing anything else and you'd be happy at it, you should probably pursue it. 
Because this industry, if you don't need it more than anything, it's really tough. It's a tough business, but there is a business there for you to work in. And there was lots of times, you know, when you're starting out, it's tough. You've got to break in, you've got to find a way, you've got to audition all the time, you have to get used to rejection, all those sorts of things. And after a while, that stuff becomes just normal. It's like you get rejected sometimes ten times a week. You do ten auditions, you don't get any of them. You know, and then slowly but surely, that ratio starts to change in your favor, if you really want it. And, like, uh, I've been doing this for seven or eight years, consistently. And within that, there were several periods where I wasn't doing much. And it was, it was really, really difficult. But it was because, and it's like I was saying what Alan said about recognizing how much you want it. And it was because I wanted it so bad that it wasn't going to stop me. And I was really, like, you know, you get upset and get really down and stuff like that. But I couldn't help it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like, I have a degree in English, and I could have, you know, gone and done my master's or something like that, and, which is something that I've always thought would be really nice, but it wasn't for me. I was like, I need to do this. I can't help it. Like, I, I love it too much. I cannot stop. So I think if you have that, just let that keep you going. And always remain supportive of other people, other people who are doing really well, because it's all helping everybody. And it's a good thing if, if other people are doing well. So I always try to remain supportive to everybody and stay positive as much as you can and rely on the fact that you know you can do it. It's funny, you know, when I graduated theater school, like I've been working crappy jobs since I'm 12 years old. So when I graduated theater school, I was like, I am not getting a job. If it's not my job in the business, I'm not getting one. Which makes things tough when you don't have any money, when you don't have like a trust fund or whatever, when you're from a working class family, and you gotta go out there and do it yourself. But I stuck to it, man, and I never took one. When I graduated theater school, I did not take another job. I didn't get a job as a waiter. I didn't get a job as a bartender. None of that shit. I just put my head down and stuck to it. You know, I did daily cart work or all those other sort of, you know, jack of all tra trades jobs. But I stuck to my guns and kept working so that I needed the business to feed me, literally. Then I think I missed some hands that went up in the middle. Of this. Is anyone still pining? Okay, yes, sir. Um, you actually said that you, as a kid you started to film and like you play with the camera. Did you do that in a way that was like you're actually making films and you're? you're oh yeah, I, I mean a lot of them were pretty foolish. They were like, like was it you just like playing around with the camera, getting like a, a laugh out of it with your friend, or was it you like? actually serious about it. Well, you know what, I, I, I know what my time's too, but I learned a lot from that, and I think, um, like, like Alan went to theater school, and, and, and he knew that was for him. I never went, I just, just for whatever reason it was with me. And I think that kind of was my training, in a way, because my buddies didn't think much of it. They were just like, oh, that's funny, oh. Like, well, for me, it was serious. Like, I would, uh, my friend, a friend of mine had editing equipment. I didn't have any. This is like, 15 years ago, I didn't have any, so I would always be bugging him to go up to his house to edit. And I think that that stuff really, really does add a lot, because like we were saying earlier, I got used to watching myself. And I'm like, that's actually pretty funny, or that's actually pretty good. And and then, like, through that, I actually learned quite a bit. So I took, I've always taken it really seriously. I mean, all, I don't think we did any dramas. Yeah, no, <laughs> and that's not what I said. But, like, I know you, but we did take, I did take it. Well, thank you, man. Well, we did it in, in my mom's kitchen. <laughs> yeah, you were 10. 12 thank you, man. Well, thank you, that's not true. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I took it pretty seriously. I think we have time for just a couple more questions, so. Uh, I was wondering about the, the pitch process to CBC. I wonder what preparation went through to get that all together. And also, how much control do you have over the other writers that are working with you? Like, you can select them all. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm the executive producer, so I, I'm the showrunner. So they all work for me, which is a great place to be in. And, you know, if you are the creative head of the show. If you're not the creative head of the show, you don't need them all to work for you. You know, you can be a staff writer, but I'm their boss. So every idea or whatnot funnels through my partner, Terry Chief, and then through me. So the pitch, or pitching the show is easy or like, or whatever? You know, one thing I've learned about this process is always be over prepared for everything. Just always have all the work done. If you don't, you know, in terms of it's the same for audition. Like, if you have an audition tomorrow and you're like, well, you're out, it's Tuesday night, and you're out with your buddies, and you're like, well, you know, so I only have one audition tomorrow. I can stay out till four. You know, don't do that. 
Like, go home and do your work if you want the job. If you don't want the job, that's cool too. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you don't want to do the, the work, it's totally cool if you don't want to do that. Just expect that you won't get the job. You know what I mean? It's just com basic common sense. And the same thing with pitching. You know, I worked with Perry before I did that pitch. Perry and I sat down for a week and went through every idea, put, up, put together documents for it. Whenever we submit a Bible, which is a, a season series guide for the season that you're about to do, you pitch it to the network, you know, hoping that you'll get ordered for every season. So this past December, we submitted a Bible. We submit the best document that they'll ever get. That's the way I, I, I look at it. I submit the best piece of paper that will be in front of them, so that when they're sorting through shows they're going to order, shows that they're going to reorder, and whether or not they're going to reorder us, it's so obvious to them that we want it more than anybody else. And that might not be true. Every other show may submit the same document, but we have our art department put together all the pictures, put out a full layout, we put weeks and weeks and weeks of work, all the writers get together, put all their heads together about really great series, art ideas, and we put it all together, and it's no different in your pitch. It should be, you should pass them a piece of paper or a document that tells them exactly what they're buying, and give them confidence in the fact that you're going to be more making. Okay, we have one question here and one at the back, and then I think we'll have to draw this to close. So. Um, I actually applied for the National Theater School yesterday for an audition. Could you just tell me how the school actually is? That's great. I mean, I haven't been there in a long time. It's a different school now. Every school, you know, how, like how much uh, drama uh, acting stuff do you guys do in this program? Is, there, is it like intensive? Do you guys work on it every day or is it just some classes a week or how does it go? It's one day a week. We have rehearsal for first years and then on stage students get it more often. On stage students, so yeah, that's like the second year. Okay, and you like do like study the plays and study acting processes. Yes. And, yeah. Yeah. I mean, classes. like Mark didn't go to theater school. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. Which I'm judged know, for. It. <laughs> <laughs> Every school is different. And the NTS when I was there was very different than it is now. I have no idea what it's like now. Like, like all of the teachers that taught me aren't there anymore. They're all at Ryerson. <laughs> you know, and now they're all leaving Ryerson, they're going to end up at George Brown, or they'll end up back at NTX. <laughs> doesn't matter what the training, what the, the title of the school is. The thing I hated the most about the National Theatre School, it's the only thing I hated about it, was the dick attitudes of some of the students, thinking that they were some elite group of people. It was like, none of those people who were acting that way were, are working. <laughs> it's like, yes. I hate, I was like, Oh my God, they've this prima donna attitude. There's no prima donnas in the Canadian industry. <laughs> there's no room for it. It's like there's no stars. I might be our biggest domestic you know, person right now. Like, people don't care about who I am. It's I do. <laughs> Especially if there's a season four. <laughs> okay, last question behind that the back. But it, it, just oh, to, sorry. Yes, yeah, it's a great, the great thing about the NTS is that it's a conservatory. And all you do, if you want to be an actor full time, you don't get a degree. I have no idea where my diploma is. I lost it. <laughs> it doesn't matter because it doesn't matter. It's like I'll try to find it. I would like to have it so I could have it for you know when I'm 50 or something. But it's, it's not like you show it to people at auditions. Nobody cares. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> I, I know where you're. you're uh, you your show my diploma. Yeah, yeah. I know him. It only matters if you're good or you're not good, or you're telling the truth or you're not telling the truth. And, but the great thing about it is it's, it's a condensed training uh, program. But it, it's all about the teachers you have and how, you know, this program versus the U of A program versus the whatever program. It's all about what you're putting into it. Is the way I see it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, last question. I wanted to ask more about the art of performance. Uh, not, the this stuff is fascinating. And I also was interested when you talked about um, you know, watching yourselves on tape and you know, like critiquing your own performances. But um, are there still you know, floating around there? You've got your own internal collage of performance moments from other people, people you saw on stage, people you saw on film, people you saw on TV, that you might go back and study or draw on. Not like, you know, slavish imitation, but I'm thinking not just about vocal stuff, not just about inflection and normal lines, but physical stuff, like the gestures, the way somebody carries 
Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you have a lot to say, too. Uh, just to speak to that, like, <clears throat> I never think of performance by uh, vocal or, uh, you know, people, uh, movements or whatnot they do, because for me, that's all, uh, that should be all, as far as I'm concerned, a byproduct of going after what the character wants. So if you're building a character from something, like, I've had a director in the past... The note that he gave me was, um, you have a great voice, can you do something different in this tape? And I was so pissed off of him. I was like, what is that supposed to mean? Like, I, do you want me to do, or do you want me to be, do you, what do you want me to actively do to the other person is the only way I can sort of think of things. So when you're building a character, you know, for me it's like, you find out what it is, who you are and what you want, what it is you're truly going after and how you're going to get it from the other person in the scene. That for me is when electricity starts, and that's my favorite moments in, on theater, in, on stage, in film or television, and any other actors. And I think Mark would agree with me uh, daily. Everything I see, I try to see anything I can all the time so I can keep learning from that. Because your point about the art is why we're all doing it. You know, the business side of it is how I'm providing myself with the opportunity to make art, and uh, daily. And as an editor, well, I'm not the editor, but as the working with the editors every on every cut, I've hired most of the people that I've worked with over the years on the stage, and I've been able to study their work intensely. I've been able to look at Russell Crowe's, uh, which sounds so crazy to me, but I've been able to look at all of his takes and compare them to Mark's takes. You know, how did I do? <laughs> <laughs> you hold up pretty good, buddy. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> He can't hear anything when I do this. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> see, that goes back. I find it, uh, I find it uh, extremely useful, like I was saying, making films and stuff. I'm a big film guy, big, big film buff, and uh, I've learned a lot from watching people, but I also cannot stand it when I see an actor and I know they're trying to do... <coughs> like, I know in the 50s and 60s, there was a big, well, late 50s, 60s, there was a big uh, Marlon Brando, James Dean sort of um, revolution. Yeah, but impression kind of thing going on. Mm -hmm. People started mumbling the lines, and so do it. But that doesn't work. I mean, you can learn a lot from Montgomery Cliff, James Dean, Marlon Brando, and then Dustin Hoffman, Gene Hackman, going all the way up, Nicholson, you know, whatever. De Niro. De Niro. Yeah, all the main people. I'm, I'm male actors because I'm a guy. And, you know, there are other female actors that are fantastic. That's not what I'm talking about. But. Uh, <laughs> What, what I hate is seeing those impressions because you can learn a lot. Like I, um, I like watching a performance can teach you something else. For example, there's a movie called What Doesn't Kill You. I don't know if anyone's seen it. It was a small movie with Mark Ruffalo and Ethan Hawke, and it wasn't a huge Oscar movie or anything. And Mark Ruffalo in that film, he does this thing where he walks around like he is the toughest guy, and you never see Mark Ruffalo like that. He's walking around like he is kind of scary, and he's not like he, he, he's not like a, like a big mob boss or anything, but what he did physically, I find interesting. And not that I'll ever take that and walk around like that as dead, but it's something that, that I think you can always think about. So every time I see an actor doing something, I'll often rewind movies and, and see what he did there. And I think it's because I just like it so much that because I find it interesting, it leads to me trying to find what you were saying, what I was saying to you about auditioning, finding something that's interesting there. Because when someone does something that's unexpected, how did they get there? How did they do that? And truthfully. And truthfully, because what you what Alan said, it's always about what you want in the scene. Everything's about what you want or what you're afraid of. So so I think you can learn a lot by watching performances, but you can't steal because it won't read true because no scenes, except a stop the theater or remakes, no two scenes are ever going to be the same. So you would be lying. And they shouldn't be in theater either. Yeah, yeah, they shouldn't be. You should be happy for the first time every time. Yeah. So I think you can learn a lot from it. It's just find out, finding out how they got to a place is interesting to help you find out how to get to another place. That makes sense. Okay, I think we have to call it a night. Sure. Uh, so thank you so much, Mark and Alan, for being here today. And for being here. It's tough. If you want it, it there's lots of work out there, uh, so go for it.
And if you don't, that's okay too. It's alright to be happy with it. Cheers. Good luck. Are you guys hiring? <laughs> Always. I'm sorry. Always. <laughs>